and uh, John is also, thank you, Leslie. And uh, John is also the uh, the spouse of Amy Harbor, who is our librarian, TCHA librarian. So John, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you much. And if you do, you know never to follow Pete Bill. <laughs> <laughs> what a great presenter. Let's see. Got to do a uh, gossip. Yeah, let me get this clicked out of here. So we get out of your way. Okay. Excellent. We've got to admit okay. Is someone doing that. And Leslie will take care of that. Okay. So my name is John Harbour, and I currently work for Purdue University Global, which is the fully online university in the Purdue system. We currently serve about 34,000 online learners, mostly working adults nationwide. Just last weekend, we had a graduation in Indianapolis. We actually do graduations across the country. Last year, we graduated about 10,000 students. So it's a, an important addition to the Purdue University system. I started off at Purdue University West Lafayette in 1994. I uh, had a fantastic career there and just moved to Global a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the things I did as a Purdue faculty member is my specialty was studying glaciers and glacial landforms, or as I grew up saying it, glaciers. Right? <laughs> so uh, I can translate on the fly from English to American. Um, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time with you today talking about glaciation, uh, talking about Indiana landscapes and how those two tie together. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about actually several different things. We'll talk about how the Ice Age, which is going to be our focus, is really just a tiny, tiny little bit of Earth history. We'll talk about multiple times when ice covered parts of Indiana. We'll talk about how someone asked to hear something about the Tays River Valley. So we'll talk about how valleys were, were buried by glaciers. We'll, we'll learn some interesting, cool scientific words for different types of landforms that are fairly frequent, uh, is certainly in the northern part of Indiana. And we'll talk a little bit about how glaciation underlies ecologic and historic patterns uh, that might tie better into what you do in the historical association. So let's start with the age of the earth. Has anyone seen anything like this before? It's a classic middle school type thing, right? So Earth, 4.54 billion years old. If we take that history and spread it over a football field, then the bit we're going to talk about today, the bit I've spent most of my career specializing in, is that last little bit, the two inches before you get to the touchdown, or in fact, mainly the last one-tenth of an inch that is that Ice Age period. So in terms of geologic history, <laughs> I'm very much a sufficient person. There's very little part of the time of geologic time I focus on ignores the vast majority of geologic history that you probably learned about. Um, Pete was just telling us about several hundred million years ago when Indiana was in an area of a shallow sea. Hey, we could have planned this together. This is perfect, right? So the so little red dot is where Indiana is on the earth. And so hundreds of millions of years ago, covered by oceans and crinoids were being, uh, uh, were living and being deposited. Go back to a couple of hundred million years ago, and you've probably heard of Pangaea, that time when all the continents were together. So a couple of hundred million years ago, here's Indiana relative to Pangaea. You probably remember something about continental drift, right? So the continents spread apart. There's a spreading center here in, in the Atlantic, pushing the continents apart 100 million years ago. Get to 50 million years ago, there's, there's actually, you can see most of North America looks vaguely like you expect to do, but there's big, some big central seaways. <laughs> million years ago, what happened just before then? Dinosaurs got wiped out by asteroids. So this is uh, after, just after the dinosaurs. Get to 20 million years ago, looks pretty familiar. Um, if you have really good eyesight, especially sitting in the back, you realize that Florida is still underwater. Uh, we don't have uh, Hudson Bay yet. Greenland doesn't have ice on it. So 20 million years ago. And then we come to today. We've added Florida. We've sorted out California. We've got the, the Hudson Bay up there. And now we've now got glaciation certainly visible in the northern part uh, of, of the, the globe. So that's the geologic time 
that you probably sort of remember from somewhere in your schooling. We're going to deal with that little two inches before you get to the, the touchdown line that is the ice ages. So we're going to talk about really the last couple of million years, which in geologic time is, is quaternary or late quaternary time. And during this period, we have on the earth a fluctuation between glacial and interglacial periods on about a 100,000 year cycle. So over that 2.6 million years, there are over 20 glaciations globally. And that fluctuation between here and the graph is global temperature on the left-hand side in some strange foreign unit called Celsius. Um, but you go from cold to hot, to cold, to hot, to cold, to hot. And each of those little uh, snowflakes there on the diagram represents a period of glaciation. And the last two, at least in the Midwest, where they're named differently in different parts of the world based on when the uh, deposits were discovered related to these, are called creatively Illinoisan and Wisconsin. So those are the two, last two major glaciations as named here in the Midwest. And those 100,000 year glacial cycles are tr triggered by orbital variations of the Earth that changes the distribution and amount of sunlight uh, affecting different parts of the, the Earth's surface that changes the ability of those surfaces to support snow and ice. So that's what drives the major 100,000 year glacial interglacial cycle. So we're going to talk a little bit about how glaciers work. This may not be new to any of you, but let's just make sure we all understand it. So glaciers come from snow. If snow accumulates, or you take it in your hand and crunch it, it turns into ice. When you have enough thickness of snow under its own white weight, it will turn into ice. If the ice accumulates, in other words, if in the summertime there isn't enough melting to get rid of all, all, all of the snow, then it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Once the ice gets thick enough, then it can actually start to move. And it moves in two ways. If it's thick enough, it actually starts to deform, a little bit like jello, or for historians, glass. Right? Those old buildings, the glass is thicker at the bottom than the top. Why is that? Did they make them that way? No, the glass is very slowly deforming under gravity. Same with ice. It slowly deforms under gravity. But in addition, where the ice is warm enough at the base to have melting, the ice will actually slide across the bed. And if you ever get the chance to go under a glacier, which I did a few years ago, it's really sort of cool. In fact, it's very cold, but it's really cool because you have the ice up above you. You've got all of this rock and, and, and fine dirt being moved along. There's a lot of water usually involved in it. But there are places where you can basically go caving under a glacier um, as long as your life insurance is up to date. So as the ice accumulates either further up the hill or if it's a big ice sheet in further north latitudes, and under gravity, it moves either south, if we're in the Northern Hemisphere, or downhill, if you're up in the mountains. And then it gets lower in elevation or further south. Conditions are warmer, maybe there's less snow, there's more melting. And so now we've got more melting than ice is coming into the system. And so you get less and less ice as you get further until you have none at all. And that's the end of the glacier. So think of it as like a conveyor belt that's moving ice down. And when you get as much melting as there is flow of ice down, you, you, your, your equation equals zero, there's no ice left. And so you get to the end of the glacier, but the ice is still moving downhill. Today, about 10% of the Earth's land surface is covered by ice. Most of it's up in Greenland and down in Antarctica. And there's a bunch of little bits up in the mountains, mountain glaciers which turn, turn out to be enormously important to the communities that live there. It's an invaluable water supply, especially since it flows in the summertime. And so in areas where there isn't much summer moisture, glacial melt can be extremely important. And as the glaciers are disappearing, that's really causing some enormous challenges in those areas. They have to look for different water sources. Glaciers represent 70% of the world's fresh water. And if we melted it all, sea level will go up 230 feet. Florida disappears again, right? So those low-lying coastal areas, which we aren't one of, right? 
um, are threatened by that, that sea level rise. Um, I'm trying to think about what to say about this bit. Gratuitous pictures from places I have worked is what this slide is really titled. Um, and so we do have glaciers today. And during my career at Purdue, I had the chance to travel to many areas of the world and study different types of glaciers. We've done research on how the ice moves, how it actually mechanically removes material from underneath it, how it shapes the landscape in particular ways, and the timing of when that happened in different parts of the world to tie into reconstructions of climate history. So uh, one of the joys of working in this field is you get to go to some of those beautiful mountains in the world and study them and spend time in them. Now, the flip side is that the living conditions are probably not ideal for people who don't like camping in extreme environments, but uh, some of us do, so that, that works out okay. Glaciers and climate change. As we saw with the 100,000 year cycle, as the climate changes, glaciers come and go. And in the last century, glaciers have been going, but they've been going fast. There are lots of places that I went to as a relatively young person in the 1980s or early 1990s. I, can, I used to stand on ice, I go back to those same places now, and I have to look way up the valley to find the ice. The glaciers are disappearing, they're shrinking rapidly, and it's not because of that 100,000 year cycle, it's because of global climate change. There's a very well-established link between human-induced warming and the changes in the glaciers, both the retreat of the, of the margins because of increased melting, but also reductions in snowfall in the winter. So you're putting less snow in and you're melting the ice more quickly, so the glaciers disappear very, very quickly. And so this is two pictures from exactly the same place. We've got 1941 and 2004 dramatic changes in the extent of ice, which if you study glacial landforms, the landforms left behind by ice means you have lots of new field areas every year. So there's, there's, there are relatively few of us who get excited by the fact that every year we get to study more places that just a few years ago were covered by ice and now are bare. We're going to talk about Indiana and the last uh, ice age. So the late Wisconsin glacial stage is what we're talking about, that last little snowflake on the 100,000 year cycles. So this is a time period where the ice was at its maximum extent about 25,000 years ago. At that time, it covered most of what we think of as Canada, up into Alaska, connected to Greenland, where I'm from on the other side of the pond, it covered most of the United Kingdom, Scandinavia, down into Northern Germany. So huge areas of ice coverage. Um, in fact, ironically enough, where I grew up in England is about the same distance from the last ice sheet in England as Lafayette is from the last ice sheet uh, margin in Indiana. So it's sort of bizarre. Traveled continents and end up in the same glacial geologic setting. Mm -hmm. So this is the Laurentide ice sheet. Uh, global sea level was much lower, about 400 feet lower. Florida was much bigger. Right, so you take the sea level down because you're putting all that water on the land, right? That water that, that fills up the, these enormous ice sheets had to come from somewhere. So the sea level goes down. If there's less ocean water, those ocean basins actually start to come up because there's less weight on them. And when you put all this ice on the land, it starts to depress the land. So the land goes down a little bit the ocean basins come up a little bit as you change where the water is by storing a whole bunch of it on land as ice. Bering Land Bridge. Who knows the significance of the Bering Land Bridge? Immigration. Immigration, tell me more. <laughs> um, well, one of the theories is that the Indians came across from Asia yeah. to North America. Yeah, so right now that's ocean but you take the sea level down, you have potentially a pathway for people to get across. And if you, there's actually been a lot of interesting work done around, because right now it looks like there's ice all the way over here. But in terms of the timing of different pieces of ice, it looks like there was an ice-free corridor at about the right time to allow potentially people to come across from Asia over the Bering Land Bridge and then down the west side of, of what is now Canada. 
Uh, let's see, I think that's all I had to say for that. So under that ice sheet, if we sort of zoom into our area of it, and those arrows show the direction of ice flow, ice is flowing from a core up here of a Canadian shield, basically, down towards, oops, down towards where we are. So for technology. Um, I guess I should use, there must be an arrow on this somewhere, but um, I'm old fashioned, I point. Um, so under the Canadian shield and the, uh, under the center of the ice sheet and towards the margins where that ice is cold, but getting slightly warmer, there's water becoming available. There's a lot of ability to pick up material underneath. Rocks, soil, sediment, solid rock gets pulled up from underneath the, the ice sheet and carried along with the ice until you get close to the edge where there's more melting and you start to drop the stuff. And so where we are, we get glacial deposition further north and up into Canada we get extensive glacial erosion, which is why if you go to that part of Canada, lots of great bedrock, not much soil, which is sort of a challenge because climate change is pushing agriculture zones up there and agriculture don't work so well with there's no soil. Right? So you've got bedrock up on the Canadian shield and also the Great Lakes are carved out in part by the progressive uh, ice sheets moving down south there. But we get to be the benefit of all of that. All that material ends up where we are. And so we have around us this amazing mix of geology that has been traveled down here um, by ice sheet transportation. But the margin of the ice isn't a straight line. There are lobes of ice. And if you sort of pay attention, the, the little um, map on the left-hand side has different time periods on it. 1921 and 24,000 years ago. And it's showing how these different lobes of ice advanced and retreated in different places because of the internal dynamics of the ice sheet. And what that means is that if you stand in one place, at different times, you have ice coming from different directions. So here, at times, ice basically came across what was Ohio, what's now Ohio and in. Other times, it's coming more from Illinois down south. So we have different source areas for the ice. And that means they took different rock types here. And so you can actually tell the difference between these different layers, the different layers of sediment in terms of the different lobes of ice that cross this area. So it's a pretty dynamic and interesting pattern of ice motion. So what did this do to Indiana? Before glaciation, much of Indiana was a river dissected plateau, a little bit like Southern Indiana, although Southern Indiana was also affected by increased runoff during glaciation. So it was dug a little bit deeper than it, than it, than it was in the past. But think of a large, relatively flat plateau area with rivers cut through it. We then stick a large ice sheet over the top of that. And Northern, Northern Indiana is under thick ice. Here, it's estimated that we had about half a mile of ice over us. And you can work that out actually from the physics of the ice. If you know where the end is, you can map out where the ice had to be in terms of a surface. So that's how you get half a mile of ice uh, here in Lafayette. So we've got thick ice in Northern Indiana. The edge of the ice sheet gets down to about where Indianapolis is now. And beyond that, it is miserably cold. Periglacial, peri almost glacial conditions. So you lose most of the vegetation. Think, uh, you know, think Siberia or something like that. So you dramatically change the vegetation. You've got a lot of frozen ground and churning of that ground fruit due to ice. And so southern Indiana is affected as well, but not in the same way that central and northern Indiana is affected. Now, as that ice starts to retreat, now when it's retreating, it's not moving north. The ice is still coming south, but it's melting faster at the end than the ice is coming. And so the end start, appears to move north. So we've still got material coming this direction and it's bringing the material and dumping it at the edge of the ice. And where it got the furthest point, there's often a ridge type form if it's stayed there long enough. And that's an end moraine, right? So that's a mass of glacial material often in a ridge that marks where the end of the glacier was for some lengthy period of time. 
as the ice retreats, if it retreats back fairly quickly, it leaves behind an outwash plane. So this is where melting water coming off the ice is now um, moving and sifting and sorting sand, gravel, mud across that plane. So that looks very different to the material deposited at the end of a glacier, which is a mix of all the different grain sizes not um, separated apart. And then underneath the glacier itself, there's also material being deposited that was carried from Canada, is now being left behind under the ice, but the ice is half a mile thick. So that really condenses or compacts that material. I was chatting to someone earlier about, you know, around here, if you start digging, right, very quickly in a lot of the areas, especially, you know, up away from the Wabash, you're going to hit that layer of highly compacted clay stuff that you have to take a pickaxe to if you want to put a fence post in down or something like that. That's compacted glacial till. It's that compacted because it had half a mile of ice sitting on top of it. So once the glaciation has gone away, you're left with some ridges, you're left with this outwash material, you're left with the till that the ground moraine, the material that used to be underneath the ice, and that starts to, to shape the distribution of soils and thus land use in the area. Um, again, gratuitous pictures, this, they're sort of fun. Um, so these show areas at the end, edge of a glacier. So you're dumping material at the end, those large angular blocks are being dumped at the end to form a moraine. Further down the valley, you've got this river that is all braided. It's carrying large amounts of sediment, but washing it and sorting it by grain size to create outwash deposits. And you can see the difference between those when you dig through the soils in places like uh, Indiana. So if you dig through the soils in places like Indiana, top right, um, there's a, a cutting that the river has made through and labeled on there, too small for you to read from the back, two different till layers representing different lobes of ice separated by um, well-sorted sand indicating that was carried by a river. So you've got this ice lobe going backwards and forwards. Sometimes you're depositing till underneath it. Other times the ice is further away and you've got river material being deposited. Also, as you dig through, sometimes you find enormous boulders of different geology types, and you can actually trace those boulders back to where the bedrock is in Canada, so you can tell where the ice came. Other times you, you get these wonderful thin silty layers that represent periods when winds were blowing down off the ice, picking up silt-sized material and then depositing it further downwind. Um, I, I grew up calling that Lus. I think in Illinois it's called Lus, uh, different pronunciations of these words, but wind blown fine sediment that gets laid down on the landscape and covered up by other stuff, or other times it's what's near our surface. But those windy periods blowing the sands and, and silts, part of the glacial cycle. So if you look at Indiana overall, we have the unglaciated boring area right, with, with you know, beautiful full foliage and wonderful valleys and all that deep carved river stuff. We have till plains, which is sort of where we are, where mainly it's glacial deposit over a large area and then subsequently dissected in the last 10,000 years or so by rivers. And then moraine complexes, so the ice slowed down, the margins were sort of fixed longer periods of time in Northern Indiana. So we have more, a little bit more topography there, large amounts of wet areas, large swamps, wetlands, because of the way the moraines created closed drainage, very difficult for the water to get away. And that's sort of where we had a lot of our wetlands um, before the Europeans got into the act and drained almost everything inside. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, Ice Age fauna, not my area of expertise. So I pulled something from the Indiana State Museum. So during the Ice Age, further south than the ice itself, we had megafauna. We've got mammoth and mastodon. We've got the teeth linked into to, to what was brought in. 
tundra musk ox. This is, we could have coordinated this. This is wonderful. You've got you brought in exactly almost the, the same sets of things that are examples of the types of fauna and uh, that we have here during glaciation. Now, not under the ice itself, but as the ice retreats back and you have ponds and wetlands, these animals fall in, get preserved, and that's how we know that they were here. Between glaciations, we have different types of animals that come into the area. So if you think of glaciation as basically pushing the climate zone south in, in the United States, so animals that can survive today get pushed much further south because the weather gets much colder, and then as it warms up again after the glaciation, they can migrate back northwards into these areas. So you get these big migrations of plants and animals uh, through the glacial interglacial cycles. Now I mentioned that, that before glaciation, Indiana was sort of a, a plain dissected by rivers. And one of these has been named the Taze River. So a large drainage system that came across Northern Indiana. Um, that river system has been mapped out by looking at the subsurface. So underneath all those glacial deposits, you can actually map out the bedrock. And people started doing this you know, long ago by drilling holes in the ground, some of which they use for wells, for water. Um, more recently, it's been done with geophysical methods that di directly image the, the, the border between the solid bedrock and the material underneath. So you can map out that sub glacial material topography. And you find this large, river system across northern Indiana coming through right here, the Taze River. The Taze River was in great shape until the ice comes. And the ice completely covers at least the Indiana part of this and much of the Ohio part of it. And where the ice is, the water can't flow. And so that dams up the river and created this enormous lake, Lake Tite. And as the, the lake filled and filled and filled, actually lake sediments related to that, but eventually it overflows and starts to develop what's the modern Ohio River channel. And so the river gets diverted further south because of the glaciation. If you do a cross section through this area, you've got the surface, lots of glacial deposits, and then this big valley fill sitting in the middle. And that turns out to be really valuable for us because that's where we get our water. So the, the well field for Lafayette drills into this deep aquifer that is the, the old Taze uh, River Valley. So it's filled with sands and gravels and glacial tills that actually, um, to some extent, cuts it off from the surface water. So you don't get all of the surface water going straight down and into your well, but you're into deeper aquifers and the water's actually coming from a slightly <laughs> Um, it's been mapped out across the area. Here we are in Lafayette. So this is across uh, Indiana here. So a large old river system that's been covered up with sands, gravels, and glacial tills, and now serves as a really valuable water source. If you're really into this stuff, and this you're not meant to actually be able to read this thing, just to show you know it all, if you're, if it's out there if you get interested, people have mapped the thickness of glacial deposits across Tippecanoe County. So you can go anywhere and, and get a measure of how deep that glacial material is beneath your surface. It gets up to about 350 feet thick here in Tippecanoe County. So a big thickness of material. When you think of the topography here, 350 feet is sort of a lot, right? So it, it is blanketed and buried the pre-existing topography. There are also maps of glacial deposits. Every field has its own way of mapping things. These strange pink and purple colors are what traditional geologists relegated us quaternary people to. All right. So a geologic map. So it shows the distribution of the different types of glacial deposits here. Most of the, the sort of vaguely purplish color is a glacial till. So most of what's around here in Tippecanoe County is a till plain. So a large the sort of upland area where most of us are is a sort of flat area of glacial till, the Trafalgar Formation. Cut into that are river valleys. So as the ice is retreating, rivers start to cut into the surface. As it cuts, especially when the ice is nearby, very large rivers cut down fairly deeply. 
and leave behind terraces. So as the, as the, as the river cuts down and moves backwards and forwards, it will leave flat surfaces at different levels. So we have upper terraces of mainly glacial outwash material. And then the most recent channel of the river has its own floodplain, its own very recent sediments as well, which is the, the main yellow in there. So that's the, the current channel and the sort of historic or last few thousand year floods type sediments. Then outside of that, the sort of whitey color is the glacial outwash terraces that are higher up. Uh, also on this map, there are those little triangles that you might be able to see if you squint really hard. Those are isolated hills of glacial uh, stratified material, means that rivers carried that. So those are small isolated hills of river transported glacial material. Um, and in some places they're elongated. And we'll look at those in just a moment here. So when a, a glacial geomorphologist or a glacial geologist looks at a site like this, what I see immediately is up in the top part, top part is the till plain. I think I, I generously call it gentle topography. I've occasionally called it topographically challenged, <laughs> flat, which means it's wonderful for large scale agriculture. It also has material that was picked up in Canada, was churned around under the ice and dumped down roughly 20, 15 to 20,000 years ago. So geologically really young material, which means it hasn't had a lot of the, uh, the, the, the minerals and the, the materials leached out of it like much older soils. So we have relatively young soil, 10, 15,000 years old and a flat surface, ideal for agriculture, for modern agriculture. So highly productive. Then as you get close to the Wabash River, the Wabash is cut down into that till plain. So then coming between the till plain and the river, they've all of these sort of ravines, okay, which uh, as we all know around here are, are well wooded. So it provides some real difference in terms of the ecology. And then you get down to the river itself and we have sort of classic land uses for right next to a river. People who play golf always complain that the golf course floods. We put it next to the river because it floods <laughs> rather than big buildings. So, so that and soccer fields, which is my complaint because I used to coach soccer down there and they always, the fields are always flooding. But you know, classic floodplain <coughs> uses where you have parks, recreational facilities that, that are not as impacted by occasional floods. Uh, kettles. Kettles are formed when that ice, as it's retreating, isolated blocks get detached. And then as the sediment, the outwash fills up around it, the ice is still sitting there. So it stops it from being deposited in that location. But when that big ice cube eventually melts, there's a hole in the ground. And that hole in the ground fills up with water. And then over many thousands of years after that, gradually that fills in with peat and other fine sediment. And you get things like, oh, Peggy's iPad in the waiting room. You get things like celery bog. Okay, so celery bog was formed by a large ice block that was embedded in the glacial material and the ice block gradually melts and you create a lake that fills in over time. I'm trying to remember that, that we have a radiocarbon date from the bottom of the celery bog and it's, it, it's on a poster at the nature center that I was actually gonna go by and look at on my way down because I forgot what it is. It's about 15,000 years in age, the very bottom of the peat under the bottom of celery bog. Why is it called celery bog? Used to raise celery there. Used to raise celery there, late 1800s. Europeans drained the hell out of it. Now we've got wonderful peat for growing celery that was a, uh, a great crop up in Chicago. So it was taken up to Chicago. Uh, eventually in the 70s, it's being farmed. 80s, the drainage system goes to, goes to pot. They decide not to, uh, to, to sort of repair it. And what's it used for now? Two things, nature center and regional stormwater facility. Oh. <laughs> right, so it's part of actually the stormwater drainage plan of, of West Lafayette. So it's managed that, that, that way. So, but, but a kettle lake and that we have these many, many places across Indiana. Came. 
That was the little triangles on, on the map. And so this is where, and I apologize for the cartoonish explanation, but, but you have a glacier and those glacier surfaces often have holes in them. And the water is pouring down those moulands, those holes in the ice and taking sand and gravel and sediment with it. And at the bottom, it deposits it. When the ice disappears, you just got this mound of sand and gravel sort of isolated from anything else. And so that's, then that's called a cane. Sometimes at the edge of an ice, especially a glacier, you'll have that material all along the edge and that's called a cane terrace. Whoops. So if it's, a, if it's at the edge of a glacier, it's a cane terrace. If it's an isolated mound, it's called a cane. Canes seem to have a particular use, a cemeteries. Right? So this is uh, Crown Hill Cemetery okay, in, uh, in Indianapolis. But in other places as well, if you've got great farmland all around and you've got this odd hill, which is sort of sandy, which is easier to dig in the winter, what are you going to use it for? Right, so it's, it's often woodlands and cemeteries. An esker is actually something similar, but instead of a single hole going to the bottom, now we have a river or stream flowing underneath the ice. And whereas streams on land without glaciers dig down into the soil, streams under glaciers actually dig up into the ice. And so you've got like an inverted river channel in the bottom of the ice. When the ice disappears, now you've got this mound of sand and gravel that's snaking across the landscape. And that's called an esker. Um, and I found one near Little Weir Creek here. So an, an esker is again, we've got this sinuous, um, sandy, gravelly ridge. Often it'll be wooded. Could be used for a cemetery, or it's a great, a great place to, to mine sand and gravel. So what have we covered? We talked about how the Ice Age is this rounding era in geologic history. I did a, I've dedicated most of my career to the rounding era of geologic history, which is studying ice ages. Ice covered much of Indiana multiple times, those whole sequences of glaciations. Most of the action is the last couple, couple of glacial cycles here in Indiana. Buried valleys, filled in the landscape, created this topographically challenged set of till plains that we have here in, in sort of central and north central Indiana more slightly more rolling topography up to the north with the moraines and wetlands up into the Great Lakes. We've learned a couple of new words. Some of you had that look of surprise on your face that you maybe had, didn't know what a cane was maybe. Kettles, I think everyone knew what a kettle was, but maybe this is a different use of the word. Um, and we talked a little bit about how glaciation underlies ecological and human patterns. It controls where the vegetation is, it con controls where the soils are, and thus what we do with the landscape. I did forget to mention, of course, the rivers tend to be somewhat important in terms of history of, of human settlement and, and patterns of, uh, of settlement and migration. So that's sort of a, 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 a geomorphologist or quaternary geologist view of landscapes of Indiana and how the ice had something to do with that. Thank you.